Um, I'm very grateful to Kai and Harris for the invitation to come and speak today. The title of my talk is Intersections Between Harmony and Amber in Contemporary Music. And I think I come at this topic from a rather different angle than many of the talks today. Um, I'm a music theorist, which means that we spend a lot of time looking at scores, analyzing, and in particular talking about the domain of harmony. The music theory has come up with some very good tools for discussing and describing harmony. However, it's almost always in the context of a general neutral space. So a space that looks at notes as kind of colorless objects. Often, in the case of post tonal music, we'll even ignore their registral position. We'll think of them only as pitch classes, some C sharp, some <coughs> C, and so on. So the repertoire that I look at most is contemporary music, music of the last 50 or even 25 years. And in that period, we see more and more emphasis on timbre as a primary component um, over the traditional concerns of harmony, melody, and so on. So what I'd like to do today is to untangle some of the connections between timbre and harmony, and look at the way that these two fields, the timbre neutral field of harmony and the very colorful field of timbre, can now inform each other in this repertoire. So I have a number of examples that actually range from contemporary music to early 20th century music, over a whole century, more or less. And I'll go through some of those in just a moment. I want to begin, though, with some of the standard definitions of timbre. Um, I know Sven Amin mentioned the AMSI definition, which is very much about the sound of a single note. These are two common dictionary definitions that really point at timbre as the quality of a single tone, a single sound source. As we get into contemporary music, and I'm thinking particularly music since the 1970s, we have more and more situations and events which are composite. They're perceptually fused events. Um, they come from multiple sources all at once that are heard as some composite event. So these events have their own emergent timbral properties. Um, this includes things like complex chords, sound mass textures, uh, as was already mentioned for Libby's atmosphere and pieces like that. The spectral school of composers based in Paris, including uh, Gerard Brise and Tristan Morais, often work with the concept of instrumental synthesis, trying to create an imitation of a target sound with acoustic timbres. This is work now being pursued at EarCom as well with their Orchids project. Blended instrumental timbres, and in much of this music, imitation of electronic models, things like ring modulation and frequency modulation sonorities. So a timbral target could be achieved through acoustic means. So I'm very interested in seeing what we can do with these composite events and how it might inform our understanding of both harmony and timbre. In one sense, they are harmonies, of course. There are many things coming together. In another sense, if we hear them as a fused object, they are a kind of timbre. So particularly when we start to think about the goal of getting to timbres through individual pitches, through these composite events, we'll see that um, harmonic thinking, choosing specific pitches is part of that, choosing timbres for each element of the composite also even placing them in the pitch domain. So these are my main research questions right now. Um, intersections of harmony and timbre in acoustic and electroacoustic composition, and particularly what we get from this changing perspective, looking, from, looking at harmony from the perspective of timbre, and vice versa. I want to play an example from uh, Jean-Claude Risset's piece, Mutations, from 1969. I'm going to play it first and then talk about it a bit. This is an electroacoustic piece um, entirely for, for fixed media. This excerpt again in a moment, but I want to see if you share my general impression of what's going on. We have a small flurry of notes at the beginning. They turn into a held chord or harmony at this point. There's a swell that increases and decreases, and then the whole complex is reattacked here. And in my mind, at least in my listening to this, I tend to hear it from this moment on as being very strongly a timbre, a fused timbre, with a lot of bell-like properties. It has a kind of metallic sound. I'm going to play this again with a little bit more volume, just a slight, um, turning it up slightly. And of course, various scene analysis parameters like co-modulation, the simultaneous increase and decrease, and the reattack here, encourage us to group it together into a composite sound rather than a single, rather than a set of independent notes. We see this kind of fused sound in a lot of early 20th century music, and very often it's evoking the same topic of bells. 
I'm going to play you a piece by Webern and one by Schoenberg that I think play on this trope. Here, the bells are these repeated chords in the piano accompaniment, not so much the violin, but pursuing an independent line. <laughs> Most famously in the works of the Second Viennese School, this evocation by Schoenberg of the bells of Mahler's funeral. And you see again, these are six note chords struck in, in two halves, three notes here and three notes here. I'll just play the beginning of the text. of bell-likeness. This bell-like quality is, of course, a timbral quality that's being achieved in each case through harmonic means. I want to summarize in this example the essential harmonic approach or strategy that each composer seems to take. When we transpose these to the same pitch level, we see that each chord has a very prominent my, uh, ma minor sixth, I should say major sixth, or diminished seventh, C sharp to B flat. That's um, inherent in each of these chords is kind of a basic sonority. This is the minor third sound, which is familiar from Western church bells. In addition to that, we have some number of pitches arranged in perfect fourths and fifths around one of those poles. This seems to be a kind of common strategy to imitate bells in Weber and Schoenberg and other composers besides. So this is an interesting model that lies right on this line between timbre on the one side, the perceived bell-like quality, and harmony. A lot of this approach really lies in um, the world of auditory scene analysis, of course, how we group these things together. We saw this in the Versailles examples. And I'm going to skim over this rather quickly because I know this is familiar to most of you in the room. One related concept I want to mention is perceptual fusion, the process by which some of these things are grouped into single entities. So in both these cases, Gestalt principles are quite important, whether it's harmonicity, co-modulation, etc., for grouping things together and fusing them into a single percept, <coughs> and may then have certain emergent properties. I'm going to return to Albert Bregman for this notion of emergent properties to flesh this out a bit. Bregman writes, we can compose a sound that is voice-like, despite the fact that not one of the sine waves that compose it is voice-like. In the sense, timbre as an emergent property is something that's inherent to the whole. It's a holistic property, not something that inheres in any one individual part of that. I'd like to draw on Cornelia Fales here as well. Um, he talks about the notion of perceptualization, and she observes that perceived timbre exists only in the mind of the listener, not in the objective world. So when we look at these chords, these harmonies that seem to veer into the direction of timbre, one thing that we're looking at is a chimeric percept, something that is a percept which is not an aspect of the real world, these real objects, but something we fuse together to create a whole with very different emergent properties. This is a um, bronze statue from um, Arezzo, and this is Homer's description of the chimera, a lion in the front, a snake in the rear, and a goat in the middle breathing fire. So chimeric percepts happen all the time in music, as Bregman observes. In general, we want scene analysis processes to give us an accurate picture of the environment, so a chimeric percept is in one sense a failure of scene analysis. Means that we're grouping together things that, properly speaking, belong apart. We're grouping together things from different sources. In music, though, as Bregman observes, we often try to create these. This has a lot to do with blend, as Phenomena mentioned earlier. We may want, in a musical context, to have a chimeric combination of the drum, the cymbal, and the woodwinds all heard as a single event. By looking at this whole notion, I thought an interesting metaphor might be not so much the ancient Greek chimera, this beast of three different parts, but rather the German folk tale of the Bremerstadt Musikanten. This is a tale, of course, where we see four animals. These are the protagonists of the story. They are trying to frighten away these robbers inside a house, and they climb all on top of each other. This is a statue in Bremen. They make a terrible noise, 
and the robbers who hear this think that they're being attacked by some kind of monster. So I think this is actually more, maybe even a better image for what a chimera, auditorially speaking, is. It's not really a monster, it's really these four ordinary sources, but they're fused together in our perception. The court, as Bregman notes, is actually a case in point, and this is going to lead me into the next several examples, um, particularly because I'm trying to associate harmony and amber as a chimera per se. The court, Bregman says, is a structure formed out of separate tones, but at least partly is heard as a global whole in perception. So we get these global properties from our auditory systems. And these give chords of all different sorts, um, various characteristic qualities. I want to head now into a couple musical examples. Um, these are from a work by Messiaen and a work by Peter Ablinger. Both are works for solo piano, which I think in some very startling ways demonstrate these global properties, these emergent properties that come out of arguably this this is an archival video of Messian um, giving kind of a master class or demonstration. There will be some footage of birds. As you know, Messian was a great ornithologist and very interested in bird song. And also some uh, video of Yvon Royo playing these excerpts from his um, work, Come La Guazo. The work is 1956 today. So I'll play this whole minute. It's quite fascinating. It's in French, but there are English language subtitles. I want to keep in mind this notion of the chord as a chimera in the background. Et voici le rossignol. Il éclate tout d'un coup brusquement. Le, la seconde strophe, ce sont des batteries sur deux sons très célèbres. Tico, 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 tico. <coughs> Ensuite, dans le grave, un timbre mêlé clavecin et gong qui est tchou. brève longue que l'on entend dans les hautes herbes de la prairie. C'est lui, il fait... Et puis, des notes répétées qui se terminent par un torcoulous victorieux. La Et enfin, des sons lents, lunaires, lointains, on croirait que ça vient d'une autre planète et que l'oiseau est parti bien bien loin ailleurs. Et puis tout d'un coup, il est là et il y a une phrase formidable et très rapide pour finir, et très forte. I think this is a particularly striking excerpt because we have a few levels of imitation going on. Messian is, of course, imitating the bird song with his voice, but then the piano is imitating the voice or the original model of the bird with the timbre. And Messian, in a fairly late interview, says when he reproduces a bird song, every note is given a chord. This is a chord not in some syntactical harmonic sense. It's a complex of sounds which is designed to give the note its timbre. So we see in this chord, for example, this was the first example, there's a kind of timbre of a harpsichord and gong, created by a particular spacing. The rau de Genet, the concrete, is this very rough sounding cluster chord, which gives it that sound like that, this kind of um, barking sound almost. So here we have the piano imitating what could really be called a timbre, much more than a harmony. I want to go on to this installation piece by um, Austrian composer Peter Ablinger. This was actually presented first at a museum, a gallery in Berlin in 2006. So if you were to attend this exhibition, you would see this rather complex looking player piano set up and a music stand next to it. And I think every 10 minutes, the piano would come to life and you'd hear a sound like this. Suggests that it be experienced. 
you can either walk to the side of the player piano there and read the text on the music stand as the piano is playing, or he provides this video version, which is actually available on the composer's website as well. Same audio that we just heard, now with a visual component, which I think changes very drastically the way that it's heard. So here we have another kind of chimera. This is an imitation of a vocal sound um, through explicitly harmonic means. Temporal modulation is a big part of making this hang together as well. Ablinger writes that his main concern here is not the literal reproduction of the voice, but this border zone between abstract structure, we might say that's the realm of harmonies, of melodies of musical notes, and this shift into recognition, this moment where that chimeric percept, this percept that comes from the whole, um, sort of spins into view. And it's quite vertiginous, I think, when that first happens. And you realize this vocal characteristic behind this all. Um, going back to Cornelia Fales, she suggests this, this notion of perceptualization, the process by which necessary interpretive elements are identified, created, and combined with acoustic properties to create auditory percepts. This is a great example, I think, of the way that a visual, um, a visual ingredient here can really spin our auditory perception in a I'm reminded here of a famous visual example, and this will be familiar to many of you. This was a photograph that I first came across in Eric Clark's book on visual perception and um, actually ecological approaches to music. Um, are you familiar with this example, this image? Um, it was first published in Life magazine. And the notion was that it's quite difficult feel to make sense of, but once you realize what's going on in the photo, you can recognize it, and then you really can't unrecognize it again. And I find this is very much like my experience of the Oblinger excerpt. Once you hear the voice, you can't ever really unhear that. So this, if you can um, look in this area, it's actually a, a photograph of a Dalmatian. This is a white dog here. Its head is down here, its front leg is here, its rear leg is here. So it's a Dalmatian on a snowy day in black and white. So you have this visual field, which actually does make sense, but needs a certain amount of I want to continue into a couple examples, finally, to look both at how harmony might be mediated by choice of timbres. This is something that I think is increasingly important in contemporary music. I'm going to trace this back to a Perez example. This is a case where harmony is maybe at the simplest form. It's really a single interval between the G flat of the piccolo and the high F of the clarinet, so A major 7. And there's an interesting argument made by James Tenney that the specific timbres assigned to this harmony, to this interval, make an enormous difference in how it's perceived. <coughs> play this short excerpt. This recording starts a little bit before the G flat you see on the, the score. actually very strongly influenced by Helmholtz. And in any look at timbre and combinations, Helmholtz is quite important. And if you recall in the sensations of tone, there's a long discussion of how different woodwind instruments can be combined to make the most graceful, the most gentle combination. Here, Penny points out that Perez seems to be doing the opposite. He's actually arranging these so that the second harmonic of the piccolo, um, the high G flat, is able to dissonate, to um, really blur to, to jar against the F of the clarinet. If they were in the inverse position, the clarinet would have very little energy at the octave because of the overtone structure. It would thus be less jarring, less biting as it is. 
I'm going to skip over my example from Vivier here, which is another chimeric instance of harmony becoming candor to get to some conclusions. So the directions I'd like to take this research are um, twofold. One is looking at harmony, really concerned with theorists, in a way that's informed by timbre. And I think this could mean a few things. One might be giving up the view of notes as timbre neutral, pitch classes, and spending a lot more time looking at the specific individual timbres, as in Perez, and their position in register, especially, how they might fit together that way. I'd like to look more at this idea of perceptualization, the way that um, a chord doesn't merely stand for the notes within it, a chord ends up being more than the sum of its parts by having various conversion effects, and that our mind is also constantly interpreting harmonies. It's not just a matter of passive perception, it's actually an interpretive, active, <coughs> there's an active contribution of the mind. Finally, I think as in timbre, we could look at emergent properties of harmony, these various characteristics that um, emerge only from the harmony taken as a whole. I'm thinking of things like the perceptual fusion, um, chimeras, as in Messian and Oblinger, virtual fundamentals of the concern of special composers, harmonicity and harmonicity, all these things that only emerge from harmonies taken as a whole. The flip side of this is, of course, approaching timbre studies um, with some tools from harmony. And I think some advantages of this might be an increased role of analytical listening. This might be looking at the way specific partials, specific spectral components, have, an, have a role in creating global timbre effects. Looking perhaps at analogs to harmonic tension and release structures, and this has been very well documented and discussed in um, the writings of Kaya Sariaho and her music as well, particularly what she called the sound noise axis, which is loosely um, analogous, as you could say, to consonance and dissonance in the form of music. And finally, I think we can spend a lot of time looking at relationships between the partials of certain complex spectra in acousmatic music and mixed music. And I certainly when I've spoken to composers of electroacoustic music, a great concern of theirs is matching timbres in ways that there are common partials, common components of the spectra that might make them fit together. So on the whole, I'm hoping to maybe return to these dual topics of harmony on the one side and timbre on the other, and take a page from Schoenberg's theory of harmony. Looking at this observation that tone color is perhaps the larger topic, the main topic, in pitch for subdivision of that. And what I think this might mean for us as theorists is returning to harmony with our ears sharpened by the experience of timbre and by serious thought about timbre. Looking at pitch then as a subset of timbre and tone color and really refreshing our ears and our experience of harmony that way. Thank you. find this in many of the talks today, that timbre tends to spread out in all different directions. Um, I've looked a bit at chords of the 20th century and spectral music and so on in terms of models based on the overtone series, which seemed like an obvious place to start. I think this whole constellation of bell-like sounds or metallic sounds is another interesting place to look. But it's true that those are only two points in an enormous field of possible harmonic colors, if we can say that, because you have tone colors and harmonic colors. And maybe the key point is just having this flexibility to move back and forth between a timbral world and a harmonic world, and feeling less of a um, 
plus some disjunction between those two. But I agree, jazz piano is full of a lot of thought about voicing and register and amplitudes of different components and so on, which seems like a deeply timbral way of thinking. Question. I, I think I see that opposition that you mean, that um, Marcus has talked to us very much with harmony as a syntactical function and timbre approaching harmony from that direction, in a sense, right? Timbre approaching the clearness of harmony. In terms of indexical qualities, I can see these referential things like the birds, uh, the metallic sorry, I sounds. Very, uh, again, and I should, I should say, I should put it differently, metonymical perhaps, so that we mm. have a a causal logic between elements that are connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I think for me, I can imagine the, the fact of exposure actually making some of these complex harmonies quite regular to us. You see this in late Debussy, for example. There's something like a, um, a very complex chord, a whole tone chord, a ballet chord can take on a kind of uh, recognizable quality, can return in various forms. I suppose we do have a lot of exposure to that in certain genres, in certain styles. Whether it reaches that level of syntax is a whole different question. And I think maybe there is a greater emphasis in much of this music on the moment, on the emerging qualities that come out of this one kind of a, um, a sort of moving in the moment experience. It's very much a phenomenological thing rather than a kind of structural thing. So it's a big question. I'm not sure where to go with that. Just a short question. Do you think there could be two opposing approaches to, to get to this uh, way of attaining the time where one, well, let's say a spectralist approach would be to try to get fusion working as well as possible by emphasizing harmonic theories as opposed to then on the other side going as dissonant as much to, to get the roughness aspect out of it? Sort of the sound mass approach versus the harmonic series approach? Yeah, and that somewhere in between you might not be as successful. Have, have you encountered that, just looking at examples and trying to find examples? Yeah, I have a lot of examples from the spectral school, which is trying to imitate the structure as much as possible. And we see even more of those in recent years, in contemporary composers using orchids and orchidae and that kind of computer-assisted orchestration approach. The roughness approach is trickier. I, I think we see this a bit in the Oblingham, in a way. Those are very chaotic kind of structures. They do manage to follow the formants, more or less, of speech. Um, there's a much smaller number of samples there to deal with, but I, I do think that they're they're quite different in their, their strategy to get there. So, yes. Um, adding to the discussion before, um, I think there is, uh, for me, uh, lately there is actually um, uh, a question uh, at the intersection of harmony and timbre that goes back to something very, very basic, um, consonance and dissonance. To its extent, this very uh, fundamental uh, harmonic theoretical um, definitions are essentially, or to, to a large extent, um, related to timbre. Mm -hmm. Like the, the fact that we perceive um, uh, a specific interval as consonant or dissonant um, comes from uh, the way eventually the harmonic 
spectrum or, or the frequency contact, let's say, of the, the new entity that is created. Um, so that's something that I've been uh, thinking about lately, and uh, I, I don't know what your thought would be on this. To me, that's an example of this, this two-way street, that we can look at a given interval and then see how its constants and dissonance varies with different spectra. I know uh, William Setheris is an American engineer who's done a lot of work with this, creating some strange artificial timbres and then making, for example, a major seventh sound consonant because the artificial timbres uh, partials line up in a particular way. We see that in the Verez too, I think. It's a way of making that more dissonant, that major seventh more dissonant. So that's trying to influence the perception of constants and dissonance of a given interval by changing timbres. On the other hand, you have a lot of composers who are interested in treating their harmonies like timbres and using that as an index to their consonants or dissonance. And I'm thinking of maybe Joshua Feinberg or Philippe LaRue or Kaya Sariaho, who have all used um, calculations of virtual fundamental, which we tend to think of something coming out of kind of a timbre toolbox, right? A timbre idea to calculate what they see as the relative tension or dissonance of a number of harmonies. I think that's a fairly imprecise measure. I think harmony is more complex enough, but it does point at certain aspects that are quite palpable, and in one sense, that's close to a consonance dissonance spectrum. So I think it does work both ways, and I, I think um, that's exactly the kind of relationship I'd like to explore more. Um, <coughs> do, do you first? <laughs> sure. I was just going to add on top of that that I was really surprised to read the theory of harmony in Schoenberg, and to see him explain why certain chords uh, were dissonant based on the overtone series and sort of the uh, Kimball explanation. Yes, um, that's a fantastic example. I've used this before because it's this from the same chapter as this last quote. Um, Schoenberg actually talks about how different pitches basically fit into an overtone series template. It seems like he takes the things that fit into one overtone series and sees that as one object. He takes them out, everything else is a accessory to that or a neighbor to that. So it really does read like a kind of auditory scene analysis sort of before the fact, before the theory. And I think that kind of thinking must be floating around in this observation about timbre and pitch being so intimately related. But he, he doesn't get to it in such explicit terms. And it's one of the few places where the overtone series comes out in that way. That seems like a perfect place to leave it today for a bit of a everybody for coming and tomorrow we start again at uh, 9 a.m. sharply. And uh, all presenters who are going to the dinner, we will leave in about 10 minutes at the entry room.